Well, then I'm excited tonight, guys. We're going to deep dive into communion. Uh, my goal tonight is really just to hopefully give you maybe a little bit of a better, I don't know, better is the right word, deeper understanding of communion. I guess I really want to kind of dive into the remembrance side, but then also looking into, you know, the larger and included reasons why we partake in communion as believers in Christ. So I'm going to kind of be going back and forth with some of the scripture I have quoted today in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11. But for kind of our Bible reading, I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 verses 23 through 32, and then we will get into it. So it says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he get, he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drink or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak, weak and sick and a, num and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Some of you are thinking like, man, did I take that communion in an unworthy manner on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of situation am I in? This is some pretty serious stuff that the Lord is telling me. So what really takes place during communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, many refer to it in different aspects. And I think number one and first and foremost, the most important thing is, is the remembrance, to remember Christ's saving work on the cross, um, to remember that there is a new covenant through his blood, through his death and resurrection, and to remember that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So I know this is the most familiar. You know, Christ is on the cross. He sacrificed himself for our sin. He paid the debt, what was owed for our inequity, our unrighteousness. And because of that, we're remembering. And I really like to think of it like when I'm taking communion, I'm approaching that moment in the face of reality that I was once lost, I was broken, I was depraved, I was sinful, I was in opposition to God and his holiness, and there came a point in my life where I recognized my need for a savior, knowing that I couldn't do it on my own, knowing that I wasn't worthy. Uh, I couldn't work my way to salvation. I couldn't work my way to that level of holiness um, in a relationship with God and in relation to my eternal standing once I'm done with this life. And so I like to literally in that moment think to myself, like, you were this person condemned to hell, destined from an eternity without Christ, but Jesus came, he conquered death, he conquered sin, and now he stands in your place so that you are made righteous before the Father so that you could inherit an eternal kingdom. That's what you're remembering. You're not just, and I think it's real easy to kind of get like flipping about it where, hey, I've been saved for a while. I came to know Jesus. He's my savior. He did this great work for me. You know, thank you. And, and the salvation message in your own personal relationship should lead to a level of thankfulness. Absolutely. You should have a level of thankfulness, humility. But, but in that, there needs to be kind of a, a driving force to, to produce righteousness, to produce sanctification, to produce holiness. Because that's the whole reason that you got on the journey is that you didn't have that sanctification, that righteousness, that holiness, that purity. And somebody, Jesus, had to die for you to take your place. And I thought of it this way. And I'm going to do a graph because I don't know how else to explain it where it might make sense. And I don't even know how much this relates to communion, guys, okay? But I'm going to talk about it anyways. Here we go. So I like to think of it like this, like righteous. 
I don't even know if I'm going to spell this word right. I work 14-hour shifts. I fire someone in a day, so if I misspell, don't judge me. All right, the righteousness of Jesus, God, okay? So just imagine, like, this is, like, a level, right? And here's kind of, like, here's a little graph, and then here's me, Jacob, right? <laughs> I'm a little stick figure today. And I come to a relationship with Jesus. And imagine this is like the requirement, like this area right here of righteousness is what's required for you to enter in to eternity, to have an eternal standing with God. And before Jesus came, sacrificial system, ritualistic, mosaic law, can you ever love perfectly, live perfectly, be perfect in every aspect as Jesus is, as God our Father is? Can we obtain that level of righteousness to be able to enter into eternity with him? Or like the Bible says, we all fall, we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. None are righteous, none see God, none, none go after him. So it's like, how do we get there, right? And here's little old me, you know. Try my whole life, try my whole life, try my whole life. Maybe I'm getting a little better. Maybe I'm down. Maybe I'm up. Maybe I'm down to try to see if, like, my righteousness can increase to get me to where I need to go to be in eternity with he in heaven with God instead of being like, should I draw some fire down here? I have an orange pen. Like, fire, you know? Fire. Hell. That's where you may be, right? Okay, so you're never going to get there. It's impossible. It's not obtainable. You couldn't do it, but God knew that. He had a plan A, and that plan was Jesus, so he sends Jesus. And so now, even though throughout my life I'm kind of in the direction of perfection, I'm progressing, I'm removing sin, I'm producing righteousness, I'm producing sanctification, I'm producing holiness. Even after the point of salvation, I am never still going to get to this point where I am perfect like Jesus, living like Jesus, that I would inherit a kingdom. But Jesus took my place. So throughout my whole life from the point that I got saved and put my faith in Christ, I'm now here. This is me here. Here I am. I am now in that place of righteousness where his righteousness is going to be counted for my sake so that when I die, go to heaven, God's going to tell me, enter into the kingdom of good and faithful servant. Not because of the works that I did, but because the righteousness of Christ was imparted to me on Calvary's cross. And because of that, I take communion to remember that I, I, I live from this place, but I never actually achieved that. Right? I move my whole life in that direction, but I never achieve it. And the only way it happened is because of Jesus. And that's why I'm grateful. That's why I'm thankful. And that's why I live my life. And I, and I pursue Christ, but I thank him. So every time I take communion, I take the juice, I take the bread. It represents his body. It represents his blood that was shed on the cross. I remember that I'm in a place that I could not have ever been on my own, that I never deserved. But through my faith in God's grace and his son, I am able to have an eternal life. I'm able to have an eternal destiny. I'm able to have my sin forgiven. I'm able to have a new heart, a new life, and I'm able to go in a whole new direction. And I have to be appreciative of that. And I think that's why there's the continuation that you keep doing this, you keep doing this, you keep doing this until the point where Christ actually comes back. And I think that's probably a big reason why years and years ago, Pastor Mike started our weekly communion so that not only on a yearly basis, a, you know, good Easter Sunday, but on a weekly basis, we're taking back to that moment of salvation to remember there is a righteousness that's now inside of me that could not any other way be there and that drives me to being a thankful person I don't know if my stick figures are really good honestly like it's kind of hard because you can't hold the board while you're on the board and have the mic so the, the pressure is not right but I hope everybody got that example today All right. Number two, what I want to talk about was there's, I would say maybe a second element to it. And that is that through communion, there is 
communion with Christ, but also with your brothers and sisters of Christ, the body of Christ. As it says in chapter 10 of Corinthians, verse 17, it says, since there is one bread who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. I think there's a, a very big reminder that we're all in this together. We're all united. We all are all the hands, the feet. We are the body of Christ I think when we're taking that communion, we've had a point of remembering who we are, what we are, what Christ did for us. But then we also know that there is people with us that are united with us in the church, in the body of Christ. And we are in fellowship with those people and that we all come from the same place of need. We all come from the same place of sin. We all come from the same place of brokenness. We all come from the same place of being lost. And now that we have our faith in Jesus Christ and we're remembering what Jesus has done for us, we're able to be in communion with not only Jesus, but we're also able to be in communion with our fellow brothers and sisters. And I think that that's a uh, very important to remember there's a spiritual unity of love, loving one another, fellowshipping with one another, ministering to one another, serving with one another, seeking peace with one another. And, and it's not just that moment of being about me because Christianity is never just about you. It's really never, ever about you. And so when you're saved and you believe and you come to Christ's feet in communion, you're not only remembering you, but you're remembering that you're now a part of this body of Christ. You're now a part of a bigger team, a bigger picture. Uh, you're now a part of a kingdom. You're now an heir. And in, as being an heir, you have brothers and sisters, and you're all partaking in that communion with Christ. You're all remembering uh, what's to come. You're all proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns for us, and we have eternity with him. Uh, next, I think we have to really look at the third reason I have here is it says in verse 20 to Paul, he says, now I say, this is Paul, the, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons or we do, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Would you, you would only do that if you thought you were stronger than He? So I think it's it's Paul's way of saying to to us and teaching us that when you approach communion, uh, when you approach the Lord's Supper, that it's a very holy attribute and it's very singular in nature. So there's one God, there's one commitment, there's one approach. Because in the time of Corinthians, these people were very pagan. They had false religion. They had festivals. They had feasts. They had worship experiences. They worshiped false gods. Uh, they worshiped demons. And I think Paul is definitely saying to them, you cannot come to the, t the table of the Lord and then go and per like partake in these pagan acts and these acts of the world. You cannot go and partake in things that you should be separating yourself from. So as I'm coming to communion, I'm recognizing that I'm remembering what was done for me. I'm recognizing that I'm in union and communion with my fellow believers and with Christ. And then I'm also remembering that approaching Jesus in this manner, approaching God in this manner is a very holy and sanctified thing, but it's very singular in nature because there's one God. So I think that's a kind of an opportunity in that time of remembrance to really renew your commitment and to, and to remember and to reflect on you're in this relationship with God for so much more after the point of salvation when it comes to producing righteousness, when it comes to sanctification when it comes to holiness. And I think as I remember what was done for me, I kind of remember, Hey, I'm also committed to not just having a savior, but having a Lord that I worship for the rest of my life. And in with having, and in with having that savior to worship, I have to remove things from my life. I have to recognize that there's things in my life that I should not be a part of. And I, and I, and I really believe that kind of leads me into the point four where if I'm recognizing that I need to separate from these things, there's only one God that I could have in my life, then I have to know that God is calling me to examine my heart. He's calling me to look at my heart, just as it says in chapter one, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 28, 
But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You come to the Lord's communion to eat bread and drink of the cup. You better examine your heart. And why? Because it says, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he doesn't judge the body rightly. So we can't come to it kind of flippantly. We really have to take a moment to ask ourselves, where am I in my relationship with the Lord? I have to self-examine. I have to confess. I have to repent. I have to desire purification because I don't want to approach such a holy and sacred moment with Christ like frivolously, just kind of like, eh, I'm just going to come to Jesus. Like here, it's part of the service. Let me take my cracker and my juice. Let me take it. Let me move on and not ever have a moment of remembrance, not ever have a moment of communion, not ever have a moment of recognizing the holiness and the commitment and not ever having a moment to look at my own heart and to really ask myself, am I who I say I am? Am I approaching the throne of God in a righteous manner to partake in his communion that he has commanded me to do that represents his life and death and resurrection? Am I taking that serious? Like, I think communion is this serious, and I think people value it this much. I think most would just probably do it as a good routine because it's a good thing to do, but maybe aren't taking the moments to recognize beyond the remembrance of what Christ has done for them and, and apply it to their actual life at that moment. There's not enough reflection. There's not enough times where you're telling yourself, am I actually, because a big theme in my life the last six months has been, am I who I say I am? When I face struggles, when I face trials, when I face situations, am I the person that I claim to be? And I've been on a kick lately, and I even said this last night at a young adult service where I've just believed now with all my heart and I'm a work in progress, so don't judge me yet, okay? I'm going to get there, guys. You just, just wait and watch. Here we go. But I believe more than ever that the, the baddest people on the planet, and I don't mean baddest like sinful baddest, but like kind of like the slang term, should be Christians. Like the people with the most joy, the most peace, just the people out there just killing it in life. And I don't mean you're multimillionaires in that sense, but the people out there who just take trials, run through them, who take persecution, run through it, who take hardships, run through it, who could have good relationships, who could love other people, who could serve other people, who could take trash from people, who could take the disrespect and respond with kindness. The people that should do that at the highest level at the most effective level should be Christians. Like Christians should be the, the meanest people on this earth. When it, I hope my slang term means something to you guys and I'm not like prescribing you to go out there and be a bad mean person. I really hope that it, that it makes sense. I just don't know how else to, to, to kind of relay that message, but it's like we, we should. We should be the most headstrong, the most disciplined, the most consistent, the most peaceful, the most kind, the hardest working. We should all really probably be at our jobs and be the hardest working people there because we're doing it as if we do it unto the Lord. And so we should probably be at work and people be like, man, that dude outworks everybody. Maybe he's a dummy, but he outworks everybody, you know, because that's an example as an ambassador of Christ. And so when I'm, when I'm coming to the Lord's table, when I'm coming to the Lord's supper and communion with him, and I'm remembering these things, there has to be a point in that time where I'm like, hey, am I actually who I say I am in Christ? Because if there's a gap in who I say I am in Christ and who I really am, it's not Christ. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's probably my lack of engagement. It's probably my lack of understanding. It's probably my neglect for the word of God. It's probably my neglect for prayer. It's probably that I'm just kind of haphazardly walking through life. I'm not appreciating the good and the bad. I'm not appreciating what I go through because it gets me to where I need to be in Jesus. But it's very important, and, and not, not from just like, hey, I think this is kind of my opinion, guys, but from here, Paul literally saying, like, examine yourself, and what happens when you approach Jesus in that manner and you don't? And, I mean, obviously, I haven't seen no one take communion and drop dead, but, I mean, realistically, I think it could probably happen. Right? Like you could really like, I mean, it happened in the Bible. People lied about what they did to, for God and they dropped dead. 
And do we really ever think to ourselves like, hey, you can't fool Jesus. You can fool me. You can fool the church. You can fool your family, your friends, your coworkers. But you can't fool Jesus. He knows who you are and where you're at better than you know who you are and where you're at. So take, those, take that time in communion to really examine your heart and to ask yourself, am I pure? Am I, am I seeking righteousness? Am I seeking to do what's good? Am I seeking to fulfill the purpose that God has for my life? Am I moving in a direction to be more bold in my faith? Am I moving to a direction to have a kind of a very bulletproof, like you have the whole body of armor of Christ on you and you're ready to go out there and partake in the spiritual warfare that goes on every single day because you're coming from a place of a pure heart and you're coming from a place of someone who really recognizes what Jesus did for them and that kind of catapults you. Because the, the truth of the matter is that there is some stuff that people could do in your life for you right now that if they came through for you, you would probably do anything for them the rest of your entire existence. But with Jesus, we don't always do that. So, you know, Sean can come and say, hey, I heard this and this and this happened to you, man. Like, I'm going to come take you here. I'm going to come do this for you. You don't have a car. Here's a brand new car, man. I got to provide it for you. You don't have a house. Here's a house, man. For the next 12 months, I paid for your rent. And you'd be like, man, I am indebted to Sean for the rest of my life. He really, like, did for me what I could not do for myself when I was in the worst possible place. If there's ever anything that I could do for Sean because I'm so grateful for him, I'm going to do it for him. You know, and you would probably, maybe not for your whole life, because we forget, as we do with Jesus, but you would probably have a deep desire to, in a way, repay him, show him your gratitude. I think we got to approach Jesus the same way. He did so much for me that I could not do for myself, that I will spend all of my life making sure that he is my one and only God, making sure that I purify myself, making sure that I produce righteousness, making sure that I do the good works that he has set for me, making sure that I have a fruit of the Spirit flowing through me in every aspect of my life. And it's not always going to happen right away, super fast. I mean, if we really look at it and your walk with Christianity, we're all different places. Some people are probably going to go like, you know, maybe like this their whole life. Some people may shoot up and then go like this, but everybody is moving. Everybody's making a uh, stride in their walk with God. And I think as you're taking communion, a good question you should ask yourself is, am I moving forward in my relationship with God? Because there's always going to be new struggles. I've had stuff that I've struggled with the last 12 months that I could be honest with you, I never struggled with my entire life. And until the struggle came, I didn't realize that I couldn't handle it very well and I needed to work on that area of my life. But now that that's here, I have to identify it and tell myself, well, Jacob, if you are who you say you are, if you have this Holy Spirit inside of you, then you got to keep fighting and you got to get there. And you got to share that burden with somebody. You got to have someone who's going to hold you accountable. And you have to push through it because if you don't, Who's missing the gap here? You or Jesus? And I will, I will never say it's Jesus. It's like God might smite me right there. It might be the end of me. So yeah, just remember, don't come to the Lord's table without serious self-examination. Examine who you are and remember that you're proclaiming who Christ is, what he's done for you, and his coming return. And then also, I think uh, um, the last thing I'll share today as far as maybe some stuff here, is what it, what does all this kind of uh, accumulate to? And it's I think for me it's really a an anticipation of what's to come. You're anticipating now that there is going to be a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem, a new heaven that I'm going to get to partake in for all of eternity. I'm going to be in relationship with Christ for all of my existence um, in this life and the next life. So I think there's a big anticipation of what's to come because we have to live our life in light of eternity because sometimes life, well, it gets kind of sorry. You know, you go through stuff. You don't know how to always control it. You're constantly having to be refined, to grow, to change, to be challenged, to be purified. Like if you really are in the mix with Jesus and there's a deep desire in your heart to, to produce something for him, to be useful to his kingdom, then your life is going to be marked by some trials, by some struggles, by some pain. But as you come into a, a place of communion, I think there's a big anticipation that, Christ, I'm remembering what you did for me. I'm checking my own heart. I'm going to serve just you. But I'm also 
looking forward to what's coming, looking forward to the time where there'll be nothing but joy, looking forward to the time where there'll be nothing but peace, looking forward to the time that I'll be reunited with loved ones that I've lost, looking forward to an eternity where I get to worship you, where I don't have stress no more, I don't have anxiety no more, I don't have grief no more, I don't have physical pain no more, physical elements no more, where there's nothing but pure holiness, joy, contentment for all of my existence. Like heaven's going to be a great place to be. We're going to all have a great time. I hope everybody in this room is coming with me. I'm going to close my eyes so no one thinks I'm calling them out. But, you know, really, like, you just think about how great heaven is going to be for us compared to the troubles that we face in this world. And that's what we're remembering. All of these things, in, in some sense, really are just a form of remembrance. I'm remembering Christ, his work on the cross. I'm remembering that I'm in communion. I'm remembering he's my only savior. I'm remembering the commitment I made. I'm remembering to look at my purity. I'm remembering that there's something that's going to come for me. Because, I mean, it says that right there. Like, you proclaim this till the Lord returns. So we keep doing this, we keep doing this, we keep doing this until the Lord returns and that we are fully made righteous in him and we get to enter into paradise for all of eternity. So I think that those are just a few things that I had tonight. I don't have a whole lot more. Usually I could talk for like 45 minutes, but not today. I don't know what else to say except this. I wanted to take some time at your table, maybe just share something that you had not maybe thought of before, uh, maybe something that you're convicted about as it pertains to, the, to communion. Uh, maybe you could be honest and tell people, I've just kind of done it to do it. And, you know, kind of the mob mentality, everybody around me is taking communion. I don't want to be the one guy there sitting there. Because I'll be honest with you guys, sometimes, like, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this about me, but I do not take communion in both services. Like, I never take communion in both services. Because I just, I feel like then I'm becoming too, like, have habitual about it. Like I got to appreciate what's happening to me. Um, so I never take it in both services, but I sometimes feel the pressure like, Oh man, everybody's taking communion. Like, ah, you know, so maybe you feel that way and be honest about that. You know, share that with somebody. You're all here in a safe place to share your burdens, to share your struggle, to grow in your faith with one another. So we'll take maybe like five or 10 minutes to do that. And then we're going to have an opportunity to take some communion. All right. So you guys go ahead and get that going. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you for today. Thank you for your grace, uh, your favor, and your mercy. Uh, we thank you for the work that you did on the cross, Father. Uh, we thank you for your victory over sin. Uh, we thank you for your victory over death. We thank you for the new life and the new hearts that you've given us as believers. Uh, we ask you to continue to transform our hearts and our minds uh, to help us live a life that glorifies you in everything that we do. And I pray that everybody in this room would uh, always take a serious inventory of their life, that they would always approach their time of communion with you uh, in sincerity. They would ap approach it um, in submission to you and your will, and that they would uh, truly take a time to remember the grace that was bestowed upon us, the grace that we could not earn, that we did not deserve. May we always be thankful for that. In your name we pray. Amen.